Hi Bowen. Today we are at the Pagota Meditation Center uh, in Nugegoda with Venerable Olande Ananda Thera. It's great to see you, sir. Suki Hotu. Uh, Venerable sir, it's a great pleasure to be in your beautiful uh, temple. It's very nice. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Uh, can Welcome. I ask you, sir? Thank you. Can I ask you, sir? Um, how did you discover Buddhism? You were born in the West, in Holland, and uh, so can you tell us a little bit about your journey in discovering Buddhism, sir? Well, to start with, I was born in a free thinker's family. We did not uh, follow any particular religion. Yes. Uh, you could say we were humanists and free thinkers. So that left me free to search for something when I felt the need for um, happiness, because I became more and more unhappy with myself, with my studies of economics and sociology, and with the world and the politics and yes. the situation in the world, I saw it going down, 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 and I felt myself uh, sort of helpless what to do. I thought of joining the UNDP, United okay. Nations Development Program. Uh, but they already had enough Dutch people, the quota was full. So then what to do? I wanted to help the world, to do something for the world, to make it a better place. Yes. And uh, when it was not possible through the UNDP, I thought, well, first of all, I should do something about myself to find happiness and then maybe give it to others. So before Buddhism, I uh, ha heard about uh, Transcendental Meditation, TM which was taught by Maharishi Mahesh Yogi mm -hmm. to the Beatles in those days, 1968, right. 69. Maharishi Mahesh Yogi came to Europe and uh, we had a lecture at our University of Amsterdam about this type of meditation and I joined that meditation. I learned the technique uh, by getting initiated into that technique. My mother also got an, uh, um, the teachings of that technique and she started practicing at the same time as me, with different mantras. This was a repetition of a mantra ah. to get your mind quiet and to find some peace and happiness within. 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the evening, and that was it. But that teaching is based more or less on the Hindu mm -hmm. uh, teachings. Mm -hmm. And then what happened is that um, while I was living in Amsterdam on a houseboat, a friend of mine, an American, gave me a book to read uh, which was called the uh, Autobiography of a Yogi. Mm -hmm. That was written by Paramahansa Yogananda, mm -hmm. it's a world famous book. Mm -hmm. And um, it dealt with uh, another kind of meditation called Kriya Yoga. And I thought, wow, this is interesting. I must now go to India to see what a developing country is like, because I was studying economic sociology of developing countries, and also to see what that uh, kind of meditation is about. So at the end of uh, 1972, um, while I, I was in my sixth year of uh, studies at the university, I decided to not finish the uh, MA program completely, but to go to India and find out more about spirituality and the practice of a developing country. And searching for this, I actually found the ashram. No, what happened is, before finding the ashram in India, one Indian person was traveling in Europe mm -hmm. and he got a lift from another couple of friends of mine, Americans who lived in Amsterdam. They were visiting Denmark and they found this Indian young man standing by the roadside uh, hitchhiking. And they gave him a lift all the way to Amsterdam. They said, would you like to see our friend who lives in a houseboat? Yes, yes. So he saw, when he walked in, he saw that book, Autobiography of a Yogi. Then he asked me, are you planning to go to India? I said, yes, in December. So you said you lived in a houseboat. Is I lived right? in a houseboat, yes. <laughs> in Very interesting. Surrounded by VOC 17th century houses, uh -huh. you know, uh -huh. in the center of Amsterdam that were built on the exploitation of the colonial <laughs> power, <Yes. laughs> Holland, of uh, Sri Lanka and Indonesia, the yes. money went into the big houses in there. Anyway. Um, so in that houseboat, uh, which was a simple way of living actually, but very beautiful in the center of Amsterdam, um, this Indian uh, fellow came with this uh, American young couple who were vegetarians mm -hmm. and practicing yoga mm -hmm. and whom I had known before. And um, 
he asked me if I'm going to India. I said, yes, in December I'm planning to go. So he said, well, in that case, come directly to us. We live around the corner from the author of this book, ah. that uh, autobiography of a yogi. So I spent only a couple of days in Delhi on the, my way to this place. It's in uh, Ranchi, Bihar. Now, uh, by chance, the international president of that organization of Yogananda, called the uh, Yoga Satsanga or the Self-Realization Fellowship, uh, Daya Mata, she happened to be there. And she saw me. At that time I was actually dressed very differently with a flowery shirt and mm -hmm. a beard and a bit long hair. And uh, she asked me, where are you from? And I said, from Amsterdam. Oh, how interesting. Second day she came around and she had uh, where are you from? I said, from Amsterdam. Oh, how interesting. <laughs> she said. So I said, hmm, let me ask her if I can stay here. She said, sorry, but we have a center in Amsterdam mm -hmm. and this is only for Indians, so mm -hmm. you can't stay here. Then I started, actually, after some time, traveling around India, mm -hmm. going up and down the breadth of India, from the Himalayas to Kanyakumari and from the west to the east and all around, visiting ashrams mainly Hindu ashrams, but also some Buddhist places. Mm -hmm. This Brahmin family of that boy who came hitchhiking mm -hmm. to Amsterdam, with whom I was staying for yes. two or three months mm -hmm. at the beginning, they were all educated, they were well to do, they had a printing press themselves and a book sh two bookshops. Uh, they said, uh, it seems to us that uh, Buddhism is more suitable for you than our Hinduism, even though they were Hindus, Brahmins, yes. Yes. you see. But they felt that uh, in, uh, Buddhism was more suitable for me. So they gave me even a small Buddha statue. Mm -hmm. And they said, you can go to Gaya. Uh, one of our relations is living there. You can visit Buddha Gaya. Mm -hmm. One of our relations, a doctor, uh, the father of one of the sister-in-laws, uh, uh, he was the district uh, medical officer in Varanasi. Mm -hmm. And you can visit uh, Saranath. And so like that, I got introduced to Buddhism a little bit. And also I visited uh, places like, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, Elora and Ajanta, mm -hmm. and also, um, well, around Bodhgaya. And, um, but I was not really into Buddhism at that time. I was practicing this, uh, that I got, because at the end of my first visit, actually after being rejected, I went back to say goodbye to these people, the Brahmins, and I was going back to Holland. And just then I met a person who said, what's the purpose of your visit to India? So I said, well, <laughs> if you really want to know, I came to find the disciple of Yogananda, but I couldn't find. Mm -hmm. He said, I know one, but he's separate from that main ashram, and I'll take you there. He's a doctor and a swami. So he immediately, after two or three days, he initiated me into that Kriya Yoga technique which is also meditation with breathing, deep breathing, pranayama, mm -hmm. and chanting of the Om Mantra mm -hmm. and things like that, concentration on the third eye, and a kind of Kundalini Yoga. Mm -hmm. So with that technique I went back to Holland, and then I started practicing that, and this Swami wrote a letter, why don't you come back and you can become a Swami here. So with that idea I came back to India after a year of working to earn some money, mm -hmm and deciding whether I want to finish my studies or not, which I decided not to. And then I went back to India with the idea of um, actually becoming a Hindu Swami. So on <laughs> after one uh, month in India with that Swami, uh, my visa ran out and I needed to go for a new visa, which is described in my autobiography. Yes. <laughs> the train stopped and it was on strike and I had to leave India and went by train to the border with Nepal and I met a Sri Lankan Buddhist monk sitting in the same train which stopped for hours and hours on him and uh, we became friends and then we traveled together and then he said well next time when your visa expires you don't ne need to necessarily come to Nepal you could also uh, try to come to Sri Lanka and he gave me some addresses like Vajira Rame Bambalapitiya ah then the Kandu Bodha Meditation Center, and another temple in Korte, another one in Pitipani, like that. So um, with that um, list of addresses, I came to Sri Lanka with the idea of getting a new visa and go back to India. 
but as things happened, um, that is now by this time, it was the uh, 1st of May 1975, and uh, I had not become a Swami there in India yet. Um, I was wearing white by that time. Uh, my flowery shirt was uh, <laughs> gone. <laughs> and then um, I um, wanted to stop first in Anuradhapura, not go to Colombo immediately. Mm. So while I was in Anuradhapura, by train I came from Talemanar. Those days there was a, f a ferry service between Rameshwaram and Talemanar, so I came by boat which was discontinued after the riots of 1983. And um, that time I came by boat and then by train to Anuradhapura and I went to the Dutugamunu uh, Visramasala, Pilgrim's Rest. While I was about to register there, one gentleman who was selling rice uh, lunch parcels to that place, he said, why do you want to spend your money here um, you can stay with us for free, come to our house. So I went with him and I stayed there, not only a couple of days, I stayed for a week. And in that house was the f curator of the folk museum of Anuradhapura, staying there as a boarder. Mm -hmm. And he asked if I was interested in Buddhism. So I said, yes, but I'm hoping to go to India. He said, well, my mother lives opposite a temple where the chief monk uh, knows English, he's very good. And if you go and meet my mother, I'll give you a letter of introduction. Then, you know, um, she will take you to the temple. So when I arrived in uh, Colombo railway station, I looked around for somebody who could speak English. I didn't know a word of Sinhala at that time. And most of the buses also were not in English that time, all Sinhala. Mm -hmm. So um, I asked somebody, uh, can you tell me or take me to the bus to Pagoda? He says, Pagoda, Pagoda, what is that? <laughs> so he looked at the address, he said, ah, Pagoda, ah. okay, Pagoda, <laughs> here's the bus. Is anything else? So he said, thank you very much. So I've met this lady, the mother of this curator, and she took me to the temple after giving me a lunch, keeping my lug luggage in the house, just here at Pagoda Road, opposite the temple. And then uh, she took me to the temple and I met the chief monk, Venerable Dawal Dene Nyanis, by the way. And he said, bring your luggage, you can stay here. I said, well, I, I can sleep on the floor, I have a mat and uh, I, I want to go to meditate at Kandubode. He said, you can do that any time, but why don't you just come here and then you can stay here as long as I breathe, he said at that time. So um, that's how I came to stay at Pagoda. Yes. And, and you found your teacher here. I found a teacher. <laughs> yes. And strangely enough, yes. on the same day in the evening, a young man comes to invite the teacher and some monks for chanting period in the hospital yeah. because his father was in hospital after a heart attack. And then he looks at me, at me and says, do you remember this morning who put you onto the bus? That same young man. Same young man. To see who he was, I didn't know at that time, but he was, and he is, a Hemukumar Naniakara. And his mother happened to be the Sabapatini of the Kanta Samiti of that particular temple, the president of the women's committee. So I thought, well, this is not a simple coincidence. Yes. This must have been like sort of preordained or, you know, like I was guided here or whatever. And I um, felt I don't need to go anywhere else. Yes. Except that I did want to go to Kandubode for yes. meditation. Yes. Because this was not a meditation center, this was a temple. All the monks were studying and then later on they were going to teach in yes. Pirivenes and schools. Yes. But yes. not really spiritual meditation. Yes. yes. So you talk very highly of your teacher. Um, so please tell us about uh, um, your relationship with your guru, uh, Handro, yes. and what qualities yeah, well, I thought, you know, even though he was not a meditation master, he had qualities. I thought he was a living example of uh, metta, maitri, loving-kindness. Yes. And um, he was also very mindful, although he didn't sit for meditation, but he did things very mindfully, you know. He, when he was writing something, his uh, full attention was on the writing. Uh -huh was reading something, his full attention was there. But also, when somebody would come to see him, 
unexpectedly, he immediately put down what he was working with and he was fully attentive to that. So that was very good quality. Um, but still, I felt I want to uh, study or practice meditation. And uh, since I had this address of Kandabode, I went there soon after. Um, and my teacher said, Venerable um, Davalenanyan Isra said, you can leave your luggage here, just take something to there and then come whenever you. So for three weeks I went for the first time silent meditation, only some little talk with the teacher who was Katukelli Sivali Hamdru those days and uh, Somati Pala Hamdru, you know, mm -hmm. Piti yeah. Somati Pala, the founder of Kandubada was there but his English was no good, he didn't speak English mm -hmm. so uh, Sivali Hamdru was the English speaking teacher and if necessary he would translate for Venerable Somati Pala and so in those three weeks I had very good experiences um, but I still was not sure whether I wanted to stay in Sri Lanka all the time or go back to India and become yes. a Hindu Swami. But so I went back to Pagode and then I went again to Kandabode and that time I stayed again for three weeks in silent meditation with guidance from the teacher and he had special qualities like um, Whenever I had a feeling I want to see the teacher, within a minute somebody would knock on the door and say, teacher wants to see you, <laughs> oh, see. you know, and, I, and he knew what I wanted to ask, also he knew immediately what about uh, I was thinking. So uh, that made me feel, yes, he knows quite a lot, not knowledge-wise, you know, but he is uh, aware and um, he's got some wisdom. And then, um, in my own meditation, I had a point where I had an experience which made me think, yes, this is it. I was completely in the present and I felt instead of this, um, you know, bhakti approach of mm -hmm. Hinduism, mm -hmm. which is like, you do this practice now, you chant, you meditate and you do mantras and then in the future you unite with God or whatever mm -hmm. it may be. Uh, instead of that, it is in the here and now, and you look at things and you solve the problem here and now, yes. from moment yes. to moment. Yes. So uh, that made me think, yes, this is it for me. And um, then I also had to decide to uh, become a Buddhist monk or leave the country, otherwise right. I wouldn't have kept my uh, visa extension. Yes. So that came next. So, yes. yeah. so sir, when you finally discovered inner Buddhism, you know, the, the here and now, uh, in that journey, starting from Holland to discovering this, um, your experience with your parents, your teachers, um, what have you to say to share with our viewers? We'll, I'm sure there are a lot of parents, a lot of teachers who are watching. What advice do you have for teachers and parents in helping people find the light, you know, f finding inner happiness, the here and now. Well, I think there's been a lot of uh, talking, talking, talking about yes. uh, nirvana and talking about peace and happiness and uh, bana, 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 um, 24 hours a day on three, four <laughs> uh, TV stations yes. and radio. But whether there that leads to uh, inner peace and happiness is yet another question. One would really have to practice it oneself to find out what it is. You can't sort of talk somebody into it. You can take a horse to the water, but you cannot force it to drink. That is the English expression. Which yes. means, you know, you can't really force anybody to meditate and find out for themselves. But maybe... Um, teachers and also spiritual teachers, monks in this case, you know, the problem is that a lot of the, sorry to say, but uh, Buddhist monks in Sri Lanka, because they get ordained at a very young age, sometimes in the local village temple, under a monk who has no meditation experience, they only learn gathas and then they go to the Pirivene without meditating and then they are taught to do, um, let's say, uh, bhujas and then uh, pan sukula and uh, bana, but not meditation. So now that is 
the main problem, I suppose, in Sri Lanka, that there is no, not much of spiritual dimension, yes. although it is coming, yes. it's coming back. Yes. Yes. There must have been some time that it was there, yes. then it was lost, I think, yes. about 50 years ago or even 100 years ago, people thought that meditation is only for the monks living in the forest, exactly. it's not for the lay people. But nowadays, especially since Kandubodha was founded in 1956 or 54 maybe, and the Buddhist monks from Burma actually helped to uh, popularize uh, meditation, they said it's also possible for lay people, and like S. N. Goenka and his teacher yes. Kuba Kin gave the example that lay people also can meditate and they can even become very good meditation yes. teachers. In uh, Kandy, you know this area, Nilambe with Godwin Samarratne, mm -hmm. world famous, became a uh, meditation master. He was a librarian of the Dia Serenaike mm -hmm. Library in Kandy, but then he became interested in spirituality himself. J. Krishnamurti's teachings also, which I also found very much yes. helpful in my search for truth, mm -hmm. um, which was very different kind of approach, you know, not a traditional kind of uh, approach, but uh, more, um, you could say, almost like a radical approach, mm -hmm. um, free from rituals, free yes. from dogma, free from um, belief. So, so the real practice and the essence of Buddhism. Yeah, yeah, yes. in the sense of yes. uh, being aware from moment to moment. Yes. yes. So, um, when, when I was working as a principal in an international school, we started uh, every period uh, after meditating for one minute. Yes. And uh, so that would have been uh, so eight minutes of meditation during the school, school periods. So um, I found that the younger the children were very interested in it. Um, so do you think uh, this is a good way of taking things forward? At the time it was very popular. Mm. So um, I would say maybe one and a half minutes. <laughs> A little bit more, <laughs> yes. <laughs> because in one minute, how far can you go? Yes. yes. Um, but if it is too long, then they may become uh, restless exactly. also. So yes. you have to find the right balance yes. between too long and too short, just the right time, timing. But um, yeah, between one and two minutes would be good. And then, actually, when their minds are more calm and quiet, they can also listen better to what the teacher has to say or read more and remember more from what they are actually supposed to read. So I think that's a very good idea actually. Very good sir. Hmm. And um, again when we look at um, teachers, parents and your parents seem to have been very accommodative when I read your yes. book. And yes. uh, what is your advice for parents and teachers in dealing with children to, with today's um, issues of social media and all the challenges that chil children have? Yeah. It's a very competitive, globalized world. Yes. So when I was young, of course, that was not the case. Yes. Even when I had to ask my parents for permission to become a monk, there was no internet. We didn't have telephone even in the temple. and. Um, to make an international call was almost impossible, so I had to write an um, aerogram to get my father, my parents, um, permission to get ordained. Otherwise, in Buddhist tradition, they don't ordain you. So what my father wrote back was, well, if nobody forces you, and if you think this makes you happy, if it is you who has decided yourself, and you think this makes you happy, then you can have our blessings. We can always ask questions later, <laughs> can't we? You see? So, um, they were very open-minded, partly because they didn't belong to any particular religion, they were not fanatic about anything, and they only thought about my welfare. But they were also a little bit hesitant and a little bit um, afraid of, uh, like, um, well, whether I would be sleeping on uh, spikes <laughs> or <laughs> you know, on, on concrete yes. or something like that. Uh, yes. Did I have a bed or did I get mm -hmm. enough to eat and things like that. Yes. So my teacher said, why don't you invite them yes. to come and see 
My father was a businessman. He didn't have time at the time of my ordination, but three months later they came. Two days after their arrival, there was a dana ceremony at Pagoda, somebody's house, and when they saw what the monks get to eat, you know, <laughs> they were happy. <laughs> <laughs> they lost their fear <laughs> about <laughs> me losing. You now you can see him. Yes. <laughs> Those days I was very thin, yes. but uh, <laughs> so uh, they were very happy and they thought, oh yes, he's yes. being looked after very well. We don't have to worry about him. And we took them all around uh, Sri Lanka yes. and they saw a lot of Buddhist places. So, yes. yeah. Well, I mean, um, I think an open mind is one thing, yes. but also certain. Mm, standards may be also necessary, sometimes a little bit of um, being strict towards the children. You know, there, there was a period in the 1960s, they called uh, the, uh, Spock, Dr. Spock, who wrote a book uh -huh. about how to bring up children right. without any rules, no rules at all. Mm -hmm. They just, you know, can do whatever they like. And that, that generation became sort of boundless. They didn't know mm -hmm. what to do, mm -hmm. and they went out of track off the track. So these same grown-up people, when they got children, they became more strict with their children. And they, sometimes you hear that if parents are strict at the moment, maybe the children don't like it, but later on they appreciate it that they've been yes. given some boundaries uh, yes. also. Yes. Now with the social media, when you go give this example, uh, almost all the children have either an iPhone, you know, or tablet or something like that and the internet and they are mostly spending their time on that more than the studies even and um, now that is going a bit too far they are sometimes addicted actually to the social media it's very easy to get addicted to that it's so interesting but also they spend a lot of time on games 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 getting addicted to the games which is absolutely um, not good for them. Even for their head and for their back, yes. the yes. neck, yes. sitting like that all the time, and also for the eyes, being fixed, you know, about one foot, is very bad for health, for the cervical, uh, the uh, yes. spine cord, and also for the eyes, it's no good to be fixed all the time. And then for the mind also to just be playing these games, it's there are a lot of interesting things in the internet. One can actually learn quite a lot. You don't have to buy hard everything like in the old days. If you know how to find knowledge in the internet, just use it for that. But if it becomes like what is happening, uh, even the parents between them, one will s be in the kitchen, the woman maybe, and the husband is in the other room or in the office, they send each other <laughs> emails. <laughs> Yeah, or yes. messages. Yes. And everybody looks at the messages rather than just talk to yes. each other openly. Yes. So that has become a kind of a disease almost. It's a like difficult a situation, isn't it? Sir? Very difficult, yeah. So the what they call the means of communication mm -hmm. have actually led to the breakdown yes. of communication between yes. people. Yes. There was a very funny, um, you know, um, cartoon in the papers when in this uh, recently there were these riots in Digene mm -hmm. and the government decided to shut down the internet yes. yes and then you see a couple sitting opposite a doctor actually he's a, a counselor and the woman says well the problems really started <laughs> when we didn't have the internet and we had to talk to each other <laughs> 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 they, yes. didn't, they didn't know how to talk to each other exactly either, you know. exactly so, <laughs> looking at this now, now, um, um, now, traditionally, we teach our children to listen to parents. And the thing is, when you look at the previous generation, um, if you look at um, the, the elders' approach to life, to honesty, to, to family values, staying away from what's bad for you, and uh, being honest, and using kind, caring words, if the parents don't have these qualities um, and insist on children having these qualities, no. how, how does one go about things and mm -hmm. at what point, now, then children will find it very difficult to follow their parents sure. and respect. Yes. So this vicious cycle of um, 
not showing by example and then telling children what to do. Mm. So it's very clear what parents should do. But if, if you're a child, you can't choose your parents. And you've got your parents. And if the parents aren't setting a good example, should the children listen to parents? And at what point should children take the right decisions? You know, and how do you decide on that? Mm. That's a complicated question, and I don't know if it's possible to uh, generalize for everybody. Exactly. Uh, it's probably case by case. Um, but of course... Now, in your case, sir, sorry, mm -hmm. um, you, you, you came out and your parents accepted that. And they yes. were only worried about your well-being. Yeah. So, but the, the average child in Sri Lanka or abroad, when they decide to uh, take uh, a step forward in life, uh, parents may hold them back. Mm -hmm. Again, it depends on, on yes, the background. Yeah, it so depends on what, what are kind of step sir? forward. Um, now, for instance, uh, freedom, you know, children may want more freedom. For instance, uh, freedom to go out in the night, especially the Colombo young people, those who are going to international schools, people with money. The children usually get a big uh, pocket money. They can go, or maybe they have a credit card or something from the parents, and they can go out and they come back late in the night and they may be doing all kinds of things which the parents did not used to do. But on the other hand, the parents also have facilitated that and given them that uh, freedom to, um, well, and if they say you should not do that, well, I mean, uh, yes, um, there are certain uh, standards which they must be keeping. But as you said, sometimes the parents don't even have those qualities and if they don't. Now one problem is in the cities, not so much in the villages, but in the cities, um, in order to live that life that people want to live, you know, the standard of living, you need both parents to work hard. From morning till evening they're out of the house. The children come home from school and nobody is there. Maybe the maid or somebody is there, but not the parents. So they don't have much chance to interact from the, with the parents either. So it's partly the parents to blame. Now some mothers decide it's more important to stay home, not to earn that much money, but maybe be more satisfied with what you have, and then to be there for the children, Yes, which is probably a good idea. Which is better, isn't it, sir? Yes. And in that light, sir, yes, now the world is globalized, we are working hard, now in Sri Lanka, a lot of buildings are coming up. The number of cars seems to be doubling if you just watch what's happening on the roads. Mm. So is this development and are we heading the right way? Because you've visited more than 40 countries and um, you've seen all these countries from Holland to uh, Burma. So uh, what advice do you have for us? Are we heading the right way? What is sustain sustainable development? Is it possible? Yeah. For us. Well, one thing that I thought of is the um, concrete Buddhism nowadays. You know, concrete Buddhism means more and more buildings in the temples. Yes. Even here, unfortunately, a yes. new building is coming up, which I didn't want. Some <laughs> trees had to be cut for that. I yes. didn't want that. Yes. But still, uh, it's happening. And, um, you know, just by having more buildings in the temple, there's not necessarily spiritual or even, um, you know, social or you know, um, progress. Um, and in the country as a whole, um, you know, when you cut down the trees and put up the parking lots, as there was a song in the 1970s, let's cut down the trees and put up a parking lot, more and more, you know, concrete, more and more asphalt, tar, and very high-rise buildings which take away the view also, and the air and the wind, sometimes the light even of the sun. Um, well, if you walk around New York City, I've been there several times, it sort of look like this all the time, you know, to see the buildings. Um, whether that is progress or not, it is really a question you have to sometimes think of. Now, that is the interesting part. 
um, what Bhutan has done, you know. Bhutan is not a big uh, developed country. It's a small country, very few people actually living there. And um, they have come up with the um, concept of uh, uh, gross national happiness. Now, that is a kind of uh, measurement which is difficult to make what consists of uh, gross national happiness. But um, generally speaking, they are more concerned with having uh, great uh, nature, 70% of the country covered by trees. When you get married there, you get a certain allotment of wood from this tree this much, from that tree this much, and then but you have to plant so many trees in return, more than what you cut or what people cut for you and uh, what you buy or whatever. So you are actually helping to maintain or even develop the level of the forests while you use wood. And um, apparently the people there are some of the happiest people in the world. They may not have so many TVs per person or so much of dollars per person like in some countries. Yeah, what is actually uh, sustainable um, growth? Now in the earlier days there was like unbridled capitalism. First industrial revolution, then more and more capitalism. The experiments with socialism and communism didn't work in many places. Even in China now it is more or less like capitalism, but state yes. capitalism. And they're um, unbridled almost, you know, not thinking of the environment. And now the environment has been so much polluted and uh, we're using so much of plastics. Now finally, um, the Marriott Hotel and the um, uh, Starbucks and also some other hotel chains have decided to stop using plastic straws, because one billion straws are being consumed <laughs> per day, I think, uh, uh, for just the, s the one chain. And um, it ends up in the stomachs of the fish and, yes. you know, the animals, and you find dead animals around the world, and the whole sea is now polluted with yes. plastics. Yes. So one never thought about that when one said, oh yes, plastic, you know, it's very yes. good. So uh, it has to become necessary to think globally, act locally, like yes. Mahatma Gandhi said, yes. and learn to live happily with what one has, not always, you know, uh, in search of more and not getting any satisfaction yes. from that. Yes. Even children, when they are being spoiled by the parents, they get so much of play exactly. goods, you know, so many toys mostly made of plastic yes. and then after one or two months all the toys are in the corner and they don't play with yes. them anymore. Yes. Since we are running out of time sir, can I ask two questions in one go sir? <laughs> uh, which is, um, what is your most memorable uh, memory in terms of good karma? What is the most beautiful deed you did? Um, and can you share that with us? And then the next question is, why is this book called Monks and Monkeys? <laughs> yes, well, I mean, um, the most memorable merit, I would say, is the fact that my parents wanted to become Buddhists. They um, once expressed the wish, and I said, actually, you are already Buddhists. <laughs> in you practice. <laughs> in <laughs> practice. Why should you want to become Buddhists? And then, so that went by, and then a couple of years later, actually 17 years after my ordination, so that would have been 1992, um, Exactly on that day, they said, let us keep that day free. And then they had, um, they said, let us uh, then have a small ceremony. So we had, um, I chanted for them, we meditated together. Uh, I gave them Buddhist names, Hansa and Maya. My father's name was Hans, mother's name was Marie, so oh. <laughs> close to that. <laughs> That's wonderful. And then, um, yeah, Pirit Nul, we had this Pustkolipot all in Holland and uh, kind of Chaitya and so uh, on. Yeah. So that was, um, uh, according to Buddhism and Buddhist people and traditional Buddhists, it is one of the greatest merits to see that uh, your parents become Buddhists. Yes. I never forced them, yes. I didn't ask them, I didn't yes. tell them, they asked for it. Because they've been five times to Sri Lanka also, every two years they used to come, 
and uh, they took an interest in it. And Sounds then, um, <laughs> yes, the last question was what to share. Um, yes, sir. Uh, um, well, I, I'm just speechless because you found your inner happiness here and now. Mm -hmm. And then by example, you set the example and your parents followed you. So yeah. that's, that's yes. a great lesson for all of us, I mm. think, uh, rather than trying to correct the others, correct ourselves and... Yeah, then it happens. Exactly. Mm. So why is this book called Monks and uh, Monkeys? Monks and it's Monkeys, a beautiful yes. book. It's, it's a book, yes. yeah, it's actually my autobiography. Yes, sir. And uh, Monks and Monkeys is the title because, well, I lived in a forest uh, hermitage in an Aranya mm. for 12 years near Gaul. And also I was in upcountry in a place where from time to time monkeys came. Even here, <laughs> yes. you got uh, sometimes monkeys. Now with the trees cut there and activities going on, maybe less. But uh, I sort of liked the monkeys. They're quite innocent, I thought. And therefore I thought, hmm, uh, yes, I, uh, I have never had bad experiences with yes. monkeys. But I've had some bad experience with monks, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> but I won't go into I that. Understand, yes. But of course, there are 5, 000, uh, 5, 25,000 monks yes. in Sri Lanka. Yes. Majority are very good. Yes. But some of them I have had bad experiences. But anyway, I've dealt with monks and with monkeys and maybe with people <laughs> also around the yes. country and internationally. But still, it just came up to me yes. in my mind as a, um, yeah. A funny title. It's difficult to translate now. The Sri Lankan Singhala translation mm -hmm. of this book is also coming out, but I don't know how to um, translate that okay. because it does rhyme here. Uh, I'm sure. I'm sure you'll get a lot of help uh, with that. Probably yes. Actually, yes. Mr. D. C. Ramatunga has helped with the translation, so it has a lot of. Ah, this is one picture of me sitting yes. over here and all that kind of thing. Here in. Indonesia, yes. all kind of places yes. around the world. A lot of pictures yeah. and lot of very pictures informative. And some yes. uh, text which is easy yes. to read. Also Ajahn Tayalora, yes. the yes. Buddhist places in India. Yes, and finally, ah, sir. It is available, by the way, in yes. um, Vijayati Yapas Vij yeah. and also at the Buddhist Cultural Center yes. at Tumunja. Yes. And, and thank you for the copy, sir. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. <laughs> thank you so much. Yes. And, and also, sir, how can people um, uh, listen to your sermons and how can they join your meditation programs would yes. you like to summarize um, within yes. a few minutes okay talking? well one regular activity that i do is on monday evenings from 5 30 to 7 30 i have a program at the buddhist cultural center at tunmula junction i give meditation guided meditation sitting walking and standing and then we have meditation here on the boy days at Pagula meditation center the whole morning I conduct meditation. The afternoon we have Singhala Dhamma Sakacha. And uh, every third Saturday at 4.30 p.m. at Bambalapitiya Metta Ramya, I conduct a meditation class. And beyond that, which is maybe easier to avoid the traffic jams, you can go to olandeananda.org <laughs> and uh, listen to my talks and guided meditations or look at youtube.com slash olandeananda and of the oodles of uh, Googles. Thank you, sir. You are a field of merit and happiness. Mm. I feel your metta. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much, sir. Sad, sad. Mm -hmm.